Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Chilitracy. Hello, happy Wednesday. How are we all doing? I assume a lot of you have come over from Etilungist Jones. Um, I don't know why I said it like that, but I did. So, mm hmm. That's how you pronounce the name now. Um, yeah, I hope that was good. Um, I assume it was somewhat less chill than over here, but now you can come in and chill. The longest jones. Oui, oui. Um, yes, now you can come in and chill with me and some Charles Dickens tonight, because we are carrying on with a tale of two cities. Doing good because of the singing stream? I am glad to hear it. Uh, who, who am I saying hello to? I'm saying hello to per Andy Pants. Just subscribed for 12 months in a row. That's a whole year. Good Lord. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. But yes, hello, Lady Mephistopheles. Hello, Ray Tracer. Hello, Parola. And yes, hello, Andy Pants. And also Sam. But Sam's probably not here right this instant because he's probably doing bins. Um, and a lovely year it's been. Well, I'm glad. Um, it has been lovely to have you here. That is indeed a year. Um, but yes, welcome in, all you lovely people. Um, Dar's chickens, that's my boy. Um, yeah, I, as you may be able to tell, I don't know, I am somewhat lacking in energy today. Um, I, I am not uh, feeling my best, let's, let's say that. So, um, excuse me, so apologies if this stream runs a little short, we shall see how I do. Um, Excuse me again. Good lord. What an attack of the burps. How dare. Oh, sorry. Oh. But, um, but yes, how has everybody's weeks been thus far? I hope everybody is doing well. Um, it is starting to feel autumnal, which is, is good for me. I'm happy about this. Oh, thank you, Andy. That's very kind of you. Take care of you. Get it out now. Yes, exactly. Rather than halfway through. Uh, Tale of Two Cities just belching loudly. Don't think that would uh, that would um, be a good thing, unless it's in character for one of the characters, which I feel like it would be um, for what's his face, Jerry Cruncher. Llama, hello. You did indeed get here on time. Welcome in. Hope you're doing well. Um, but yes, unless there is an opportune moment. Exactly. If there's an opportune moment to let fly a belch. I probably won't be able to. So there we go. I can't burp on um, Q. Rick and Morty VO vibes. Yes, exactly. I do I do have a lot of admiration for people who can burp on Q. It's quite impressive. It's like the kids who, like, at school, there's always that one kid who can burp the alphabet. There's always one. Um, but, uh, but yes, how's everybody doing? How's everybody's weeks been? Uh, mine has happened. I have, I have, again, completely lost track of what's going on with time and stuff um but uh yeah what it, it's wednesday for some reason it feels later in the week i don't know why but it does um i i played for a, a quite a fun wedding on saturday where the bride and groom had requested the victory march from star wars as they walked back down the aisle, uh, which was pretty great. It's probably had the best reaction for any recessional music I've ever played. It was quite spectacular because they left it as a surprise. Um, and there was just everybody sort of looking around going, oh, is this what I think it is? Is this what I think it is? And then just erupting into cheers. It was, it was pretty great. Um, one thing you could say about your week is that it has happened. Okay, I hope that's a good thing. Also, hello, Emsley. Hope you're well. Oh, Sam's in. Hello, Sam. Um, for me, it, for you, it feels like Tuesday because of the bank holiday. Oh, that's why it feels weird. It was a bank holiday on Monday. Of course. Your week has been filled with mosquitoes, Parola. Ugh. You're very happy that you don't get itchy mosquito bites anymore. Well, that's good. Um, for some reason, this summer, at least here, I feel like all the bitey things, it, they've, just got, they've just got been particularly bad this year. Um, like, yeah, just itchy and nasty. I've I've had some really nasty bites this year, and I don't usually get bitten. Dreadful. Um, you had a stupid busy morning at work, but you left at noon and left all the messes for other people to figure out. Nice. That is always a good thing. But for you, it's the greatest day of your life. Right. 
Oh, for you it was a Tuesday. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Got the reference. Um, but yes, I'm glad it's been an excellent day for you, Andy. That is that is marvellous and good, etc. Oh, excuse me. Oh. oh, dear. Doing well. Doing so very well. Um, it's been raining lots lately. Some mosquitoes have met many, many, many... Oh, yeah, that's true. Yes, it has been, it has been pretty... Um, pretty damp in general we are going to be reading from chapter 15 book 2 chapter 15 today um, but yes um, if we have all been uh, catching up with Tale of Two Cities also let me know if I'm a bit quiet I feel like I'm talking a little bit more quietly today um, but um, yes uh, so far in A Tale of Two Cities. I mean, we're almost... Actually, I think mm, we probably will be halfway through by the end of tonight, possibly. But basically, what has happened so far, stuff and things, um, just kind of setting things up, really. Um, Sidney Carton's been guilt-tripping What's-Her-Face, um, Lucy Manette. Being all like, oh, I know you don't love me, but I, you must think of me fondly when I drink myself to death. Um, it's all fine. Uh, thing, um, Charles Darnay has killed his uncle. It's all good. Um, everyone's fallen in love with Lucy and not handled it very well. Uh, I wish, I, I wish to correct. It is spelt L-U-C-I-E in the book because otherwise that is going to get very confusing. <laughs> Not everybody has fallen in love with me. <laughs> it is it is Lucy is in the French spelling, she says, in an appalling French accent. Um uh, and that you know of. <laughs> oh well I hope not. Um But uh What was the song? Uh yes, um she obviously likes Charles Darnay best. Kind of giving that vibe. Um what else has been happening? Oh, what's his face? Striver decided, the lawyer, decided to, um, that he fancied his chances at proposing to her. But Mr. Laurie was like, yeah, maybe, maybe don't. Maybe, maybe don't. Um, there is more unrest in various places, mainly France. And, um, Jerry Cruncher, who is like the general handyman who is sort of tasked with general stuff um, for Telson's bank uh, we have discovered that he is a grave robber so that's fun um, he's not a nice man we don't like him, he beats his wife um, therefore yes, not not a good not a good guy, not a good guy um, so I think that's pretty much everything that happened last time um, or at least so far as I can remember because last week I didn't stream because I was ill or something? I don't know. I can't remember. I've lost track of time, as I say. Um, or did I stream? I cannot remember. I think I was travelling back anyway. Doesn't matter. I am here now. Um, but yes. <laughs> We've got some good chapter names for this next part, actually. It's quite fun. I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. I didn't stream last week. Uh, my my deepest apologies for you all, but I hope that has meant that those of you who were needing to catch up have managed to catch up. That is always a, a good a good uh, side effect to having a new stream for a week. Um, do I have anything else to say before I start reading? Um, I don't believe so. Yeah, don't think so. So, if we are sitting comfortably, um, if we have some some kind of hot beverage um, of some description, or not hot beverage, depending on the temperature where you are, I just have water. Um, and I hope you're all not being bothered by bitey things. Um, and, yeah, we shall, we shall continue with... A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Two, Chapter Fifteen Knitting 
There had been earlier drinking than usual in the wine shop of Monsieur de Farge. As early as six o'clock in the morning, sallow faces peeping through its barred windows had descried other faces within, bending over measures of wine. Monsieur de Farge sold a very thin wine at the best of times, but it would seem to have been an unusually thin wine that he sold at this time. A sour wine, moreover, or a sour ring, for its influence on the mood of those who drank it was to make them gloomy. No vivacious bacchanalian flame leaped out of the pressed grape of Monsieur Defarge, but a smouldering fire that burnt in the dark lay hidden in the dregs of it. This had been the third morning in succession on which there had been early drinking at the wine shop of Monsieur Defarge. It had been begun on Monday, and here was Wednesday come. There had been more of early brooding than drinking, for many men had listened and whispered and slunk about there from the time of the opening of the door, who could not have laid a piece of money on the counter to save their souls. These were to the full as interested in the place, however, as if they could have commanded whole barrels of wine, and they glided from seat to seat and from corner to corner, swallowing talk in lieu of drink with greedy looks. Notwithstanding an unusual flow of company, the master of the wine shop was not visible. He was not missed, for nobody who crossed the threshold looked for him, nobody asked for him, nobody wondered to see only Madame Defarge in her seat, presiding over the distribution of wine, with a bowl of battered small coins before her, as much defaced and beaten out of their original impress as the small coinage of humanity from whose ragged pockets they had come. A suspended interest and a prevalent absence of mind were perhaps observed by the spies who looked in at the wine shop, as they looked in at every place, high and low, from the king's palace to the criminal's jail. Games at cards languished, Players at dominoes musingly built towers with them. Drinkers drew figures on the tables with spilt drops of wine. Madame Defarge herself picked out the pattern on her sleeve with her toothpick and saw and heard something invisible, uh, sorry, inaudible and invisible a long way off. Thus, Saint Antoine in this vinous feature of his until midday. It was high noontide when two dusty men passed through his streets and under his swinging lamps, of whom one was Monsieur Defarge, the other a mender of roads in a blue cap. All a dust and a thirst, the two entered the wine shop. Their arrival had lighted a kind of fire in the breast of Saint Antoine, fast spreading as they came along which stirred and flickered in flames of faces at most doors and windows. Yet no one had followed them, and no man spoke when they entered the wine shop, though the eyes of every man there were turned upon them. "'Good day, gentlemen,' said Monsieur Defarge. It may have been a signal for loosening the general tongue. It elicited an answering chorus of good day. It is bad weather, gentlemen, said Defarge, shaking his head. Upon which every man looked at his neighbour, and then all cast down their eyes and sat silent. Except one man, who got up and went out. My wife, said Defarge aloud, addressing Madame Defarge, I have travelled certain leagues with this good mender of roads, called Jacques. I met him by accident, a day and half's journey out of Paris. He is a good child, this mender of roads, called Jacques. Give him to drink, my wife. A second man got up and went out. Madame Defarge set wine before the mender of roads called Jacques, who doffed his blue cap to the company, and drank. In the breast of his blouse he carried some coarse dark bread, he ate of this between whiles, and sat munching and drinking near Madame Defarge's counter. A third man got up and went out. 
Defarge refreshed himself with a draught of wine, but he took less than was given to the stranger, as being himself a man to whom it was no rarity, and stood waiting until the countryman had made his breakfast. He looked at no one present, and no one now looked at him, not even Madame Defarge, who had taken up her knitting and was at work. Have you finished your repast, friend? he asked in due season. Yes, thank you. Come then, you shall see the apartment that I told you you could occupy. It will suit you to a marvel. Out of the wine shop into the street, out of the street into a courtyard, out of the courtyard up a steep staircase, out of the staircase into a garret. Formerly the garret where a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy, making shoes. No white-haired man was there now, but the three men were there who had gone out of the wine shop singly. And between them and the white-haired man afar off was the one small link, that they had once looked in at him through the chinks in the wall. Defarge closed the door carefully, and spoke in a subdued voice. Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques three. This is the witness encountered by appointment by me, Jacques four. He will tell you all. Speak, Jacques five. The mender of roads, blue cap in hand, wiped his swarthy forehead with it, and said, Where shall I commence, monsieur? Commence? was Monsieur Defarge's not unreasonable reply, at the commencement. I saw him then, messieurs, began the mender of roads, a year ago this running summer, underneath the carriage of the Marquis, hanging by the chain. Behold the manner of it. I leaving my work on the road, the sun going to bed, the carriage of the Marquis slowly ascending the hill, he hanged by the chain, like this. Again the mender of roads went through the whole performance, in which he ought to have been perfect by that time, seeing that it had been the infallible resource and indispensable entertainment of his village during a whole year. Jacques I struck in, and asked if he had ever seen the man before. Never, asked, answered the mender of roads, recovering his perpendicular. Jacques III demanded how he afterwards recognised sorry, how he afterwards recognised him then. By his tall figure, said the mender of roads, softly and with his finger at his nose. When Monsieur the Marquis demands that evening, say what is he like, I make the response, tall as a spectre. You should have said short as a dwarf, returned Jacques II. But what did I know? The deed was not then accomplished, neither did he confide in me. Observe, under those circumstances even, I do not offer my testimony. Monsieur the Marquis indicates me with his finger, standing near our little fountain, and says, To me, bring that rascal. My faith, messieurs, I offer nothing. He is right there, Jacques, murmured Defarge to him who had interrupted. Go on. Good said the mender of roads with an air of mystery. The tall man is lost, and he has sought how many months? Nine? Ten? Eleven? No matter the number, said Defarge. He is well hidden, but at last he is unluckily found. Go on. I am again at work upon the hillside, and the sun is again about to go to bed. I am collecting my tools to descend to my cottage down in the village below, where it is already dark, when I raise my eyes and see coming over the hill six soldiers. In the midst of them is a tall man with his arms excuse me, with his arms bound, tied to his sides like this. With the aid of his indispensable cap, he represented a man with his elbows bound fast at his hips, with cords that were knotted behind him. I stand aside, messieurs, by my heap of stones, to see the soldiers and their prisoner pass, for it is a solitary road, that where any spectacle is well worth looking at. And at first, as they approach, I see no more than that they are six soldiers with a tall man bound, and that they are almost black to my sight, 
except on the side of the sun going to bed, where they have a red edge, mos uh, mos messieurs. Also, I see that their long shadows are on the hollow ridge on the opposite side of the road, and are on the hill above it, and they are like the shadows of giants. Also, I see that they are covered with dust, and that the dust moves with them as they come, tramp, tramp. But when they advance quite near to me, I recognise the tall man, and he recognises me. Ah, but he would be well content to precipitate himself over the hillside once again, as on the evening when he and I first encountered close to the same spot. He described it as if he were there, and it was evident that he saw it vividly. Perhaps he had not seen much in his life. I do not show the soldiers that I recognise the tall man. He does not show the soldiers that he recognises me. We do it and we know it with our eyes. Come on, says the chief of that company, pointing to the village. Bring him fast to his tomb. And they bring him faster. I follow. His arms are swelled because of being bound so tight. His wooden shoes are large and clumsy, and he is lame because he is lame and consequently slow. They drive him with their guns, like this. He imitated the action of a man's being impelled forward by the butt ends of muskets. As they descend the hill like madmen running a race, he falls. They laugh and pick him up again. His face is bleeding and covered with dust, but he cannot touch it. Thereupon they laugh again. They bring him into the village. All the village runs to look. They take him past the mill and up to the prison. All the village sees the prison gate open in the darkness of the light night and swallow him, like this. He opened his mouth as wide as he could and shut it with a sounding snap of his teeth. Observant of his unwillingness to mar the effect by opening it again, Defarge said, Go on, Jacques. All the village, pursued the mender of roads, on tiptoe and in a low voice, withdraws. All the village whispers by the fountain. All the village sleeps. All the village dreams of the unhappy one within the locks and bars of the prison on the crag, and never to come out of it except to perish. In the morning, with my tools upon my shoulder, eating my morsel of black bread as I go, I make a circuit by the prison, on my way to my work. There I see him, high up, behind the bars of a lofty iron cage, bloody and dusty as last night, looking through. He has no hand free to wave to me. I dare not call to him. He regards me like a dead man. Defarge and the three glanced darkly at one another. The looks of all of them were dark, repressed and revengeful, as they listened to the countryman's story. The manner of all of them, while it was secret, was authoritative too. They had the air of a rough tribunal, Jacques one and two sitting on the old pallet bed, each with his chin resting on his hand and his eyes intent on the road mender. Jacques three, equally intent, on one knee behind them, with his agitated hand always gliding over the network of fine nerves about his mouth and nose. Defarge standing between them, and the narrator, whom he had stationed in the light of the window, by turns looking from him to them, and from them to him. "'Go on, Jacques,' said Defarge. "'He remains up there in his iron cage some days,' The village looks at him by stealth, for it is afraid. But it always looks up, from a distance, at the prison on the crag, and in the evening, when the work of the day is achieved and it assembles to gossip at the fountain, all faces are turned towards the prison. Formerly they were turned towards the posting house, now they are all turned towards the prison. They whisper at the fountain that although condemned to death, he will not be executed. They say that petitions have been presented in Paris, showing that he was enraged and made mad by the death of his child. They say that a petition has been presented to the king himself. What do I know? It is possible. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Listen then, Jacques. 
number one of that name, sternly interposed. Know that a petition was, was presented to the king and queen. All here, yourself excepted, saw the king take it in his carriage in the street, sitting beside the queen. It is Defarge whom you see here, who at the hazard of his life darted out before the horses with the petition in his hand. And once again, listen, Jacques, said the kneeling number three, his fingers ever wandering over and over those fine nerves, with a strikingly greedy air, as if he hungered for something that was neither food nor drink. The guard, horse and foot, surrounded the petitioner and struck him blows. You hear? I hear, messieurs. Go on, then, said Defarge. Again, on the other hand, they whisper at the fountain, resumed the countryman, that he is brought down into our country to be executed on the spot, and that he will very certainly be executed. They even whisper that because he has slain Monseigneur, and because Monseigneur was the father of his tenants, serfs, what you will, he will be executed as a parricide. One old man says at the fountain that his right hand, armed with the knife, will be burnt off before his face, that into wounds which will be made in his arms, his breast and his legs, there will be poured boiling oil, melted lead, hot resin, wax and sulphur. Finally, that he will be torn limb from limb by four strong horses. That old man says all this was actually done to a prisoner who made an attempt on the life of the late king, Louis XV. But how do I know if he lies? I am not a scholar. Listen once again, then, Jacques, said the man with the restless hand and the craving air. The name of that prisoner was Damien, and it was all done in open day in the open streets of this city of Paris, and nothing was more noticed in the vast concourse that saw it done than the crowd of ladies of quality and fashion who were full of eager attention to the last. To the last, Jacques, prolonged until nightfall, when he had lost two legs and an arm and still breathed. And it was done... Why, how old are you? Thirty-five, said the mender of roads, who looked sixty. It was done when you were more than ten years old. You might have seen it. Enough, said Defarge with grim impatience. Long live the devil. Go on. Well, some whisper this, some whisper that. They speak of nothing else. Even the fountain appears to fall to that tune. At length, on Sunday night, when all the village is asleep, come soldiers winding down from the prison and their guns ring on the stones of the little street. Workmen dig, workmen hammer, soldiers laugh and sing. In the morning, by the fountain, there is raised a gallows forty feet high, poisoning the water. The mender of roads looked through rather than at the low ceiling, and pointed as if he saw the gallows somewhere in the sky. All work is stopped, all assemble there. Nobody leads the cows out. The cows are there with the rest. At midday, the roll of drums. Soldiers have marched into the prison in the night, and he is in the midst of many soldiers. He is bound as before, and in his mouth there is a gag, tied so with a tight string, making him look almost as if he laughed. He suggested it by creasing his face with his two thumbs from the corners of his mouth to his ears. On the top of the gallows is fixed the knife, blade upwards with its point in the air. He is hanged there forty feet high and is left hanging, poisoning the water. They looked at one another as he used his blue cap to wipe his face on which the perspiration had started afresh while he recalled the spectacle. It is frightful, messieurs. How can the women and the children draw water? Who can gossip of an evening under that shadow? Under it, have I said. When I left the village, Monday evening as the sun was going to bed, and looked back from the hill, 
The shadow struck across the church, across the mill, across the prison, seemed to strike across the earth, messieurs, to where the sky rests upon it. The hungry man gnawed one of his fingers as he looked at the other three, and his finger quivered with the craving that was on him. That's all, messieurs. I left at sunset, as I had been warned to do, and I walked on that night and half next day, as I, until I met, as I was warned I should, this comrade. With him I came on, now riding and now walking, through the rest of yesterday and through last night, and here you see me. After a gloomy silence, the first Jacques said, Good. You have acted and recounted faithfully. Will you wait for us a little, outside the door? Very willingly, said the mender of roads, whom Defarge escorted to the top of the stairs, and, leaving seated there, returned. The three had risen, and their heads were together when he came back, when he came back to the garret. How say you, Jacques? demanded number one. To be registered? To be registered as doomed to destruction, returned Defarge. Magnificent, croaked the man with the craving. The chateau and all the race, inquired the first. The chateau and all the race, returned Defarge. Extermination. The hungry man repeated in a rapturous croak, Magnificent, and began gnawing another finger. Are you sure, asked Jacques II of Defarge, that no embarrassment can arise from our manner of keeping the register? Without doubt it is safe, for no one beyond ourselves can decipher it. But shall we always be able to decipher it? Or, I ought to say, will she? Jacques, returned Defarge, drawing himself up. If Madame, my wife, undertook to keep the register in her memory alone, she would not lose a word of it, not a syllable of it. Knitted in her own stitches and her own symbols, it will always be as plain to her as the sun. Confide in Madame Defarge. It would be easier for the weakest poltroon that lives to erase himself from existence than to erase one letter of his name or crimes from the knitted register of Madame Defarge. There was a murmur of confidence and approval, and then the man who hungered asked, Is this rustic to be sent back soon? I hope so. He is very simple. Is he not a little dangerous? He knows nothing, said Defarge, at least nothing more than would easily elevate himself to a gallows of the same height. I charge myself with him. Let him remain with me. I will take care of him and set him on his road. He wishes to see the fine world, the king, the queen and court. Let him see them on Sunday. What? exclaimed the hungry man, staring. Is it a good sign that he wishes to see royalty and nobility? Jacques, said Defarge, Judici uh, judiciously show a cat milk if you wish her to thirst for it. Judiciously show a dog his natural prey if you wish him to bring it down, bring it down one day. Nothing more was said, and the mender of roads, being found already dozing on the topmost stair, was advised to lay himself down on the pallet bed and take some rest. He needed no persuasion and was soon asleep. Worse quarters than Defarge's wine shop could, e could easily have been found in Paris for a provincial slave of that degree. Saving for a mysterious dread of Madame by which he was constantly haunted, his life was very new and agreeable. But Madame sat all day at her counter, so expressly unconscious of him, and so particularly determined not to perceive that his being there had any connection with anything below the surface, that he shook in his wooden shoes whenever his eye lighted upon her. 
for he contended with himself that it was impossible to foresee what that lady might pretend next, and he felt assured that if she should take into her brightly ornamented head to pretend that she had seen him do a murder and afterwards flay the victim, she would infallibly go through with it until the play was played out. Therefore, when Sunday came, the mender of roads was not enchanted, though he said he was, to find that Madame was to accompany Monsieur and himself to Versailles. It was additionally disconcerting to have Madame knitting all the way there in a public conveyance. It was additionally disconcerting yet to have Madame in the crowd in the afternoon, still with her knitting in her hands as the crowd waited to see the carriage of the King and Queen. "'You work hard, madame,' said a man near her. "'Yes,' answered Madame Defarge. "'I have a good deal to do.' "'What do you make, madame?' "'Many things.' "'For instance?' "'For instance,' returned Madame Defarge composedly, "'shrouds.' The man moved a little further away as soon as he could, and the mender of roads fanned himself with his blue cap, feeling it mightily close and oppressive. If he needed a king and queen to restore him, he was fortunate in having his remedy at hand, for soon the large-faced king and the fair-faced queen came in their golden coach, attended by the shining bull's-eye of their court, a glittering multitude of laughing ladies and fine lords, and in jewels and silks and powder and splendour and elegantly spurning figures and handsomely disdainful faces of both sexes, the mender of roads bathed himself, so much to his temporary intoxication that he cried, Long live the king, long live the queen, long live everybody and everything, as if he had never heard of ubiquitous Jack in his time. Then there were gardens, courtyards, terraces, fountains, green banks, more king and queen, more bullseye, more lords and ladies, more long live they all, until he absolutely wept with sentiment. During the whole of this scene, which lasted some three hours, he had plenty of shouting and weeping and sentimental company, and throughout Defarge held him by the collar as if to restrain him from flying at the objects of his brief devotion and tearing them to pieces. Bravo, said Defarge, clapping him on the back when it was over, like a patron. You are a good boy. The mender of roads was now coming to himself and was mistrustful of having made a mistake in his late demonstrations, but no. "'You are the fellow we want,' said Defarge in his ear. "'You make these fools believe that it will last for ever. "'Then they are the more insolent, and it is the nearer ended.' "'Hey!' cried the mender of roads reflectively. "'That's true.' These fools know nothing. While they despise your breath and would stop it for ever and ever, in you or in a hundred like you rather than in one of their own horses or dogs, they only know what your breath tells them. Let it deceive them, then, a little longer. It cannot deceive them too much. Madame Defarge looked superciliously at the client and nodded in confirmation. As to you, said she, you would shout and shed tears for anything, if it made a show and a noise. Say, would you not? Truly, madame, I think so, for the moment. If you were shown a great heap of dolls, and were set upon them to pluck them to pieces and despoil them for your own advantage, you would pick out the richest and the gayest. Say, would you not? Truly, yes, madame. Yes. And if you were shown a flock of birds, unable to fly, and were set upon them to strip them of their feathers for your own advantage, you would set upon the birds of the finest feathers, would you not? It is true, madame. 
You have seen both dolls and birds today, said Madame Defarge, with a wave of her hand towards the place where they had last been apparent. Now, go home. Chapter 16 Still Knitting Madame Defarge and Monsieur, her husband, returned amicably to the bosom of Saint Antoine, while a speck in a blue cap toiled through the darkness and through the dust and down the weary miles of avenue by the wayside, slowly tending towards that point of the compass where the chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, now in his grave, listened to the whispering trees. Such ample leisure had the stone faces now for listening to the trees and to the fountain, that the few village scarecrows who, in their quest for herbs to eat and fragments of dead stick to burn, stay, strayed within sight of the great stone courtyard and terrace staircase, had it borne in, their, in upon their starved fancy that the expression of the faces was altered. A rumour just lived in the village, had a faint and bare existence there, as its people had, that when the knife struck home, the faces changed from, fra from, from faces of pride to faces of anger and pain. Also, that when that dangling figure was hauled up forty feet above the fountain, they changed again and bore a cruel look of being avenged which they would henceforth bear for ever. In the stone face over the great window of the bedchamber where the murder was done, two fine dints were pointed out in the sculptured nose, which everybody recognised, and which nobody had seen of old. And on the scarce occasions when two or three ragged peasants emerged from the crowd to take a hurried peep at Monsieur the Marquis petrified, a skinny finger would not have pointed to it for a minute before they all started away among the moss and leaves, like the more fortunate hares who could find a living there. Chateau and hut, stone face and dangling figure, the red stain on the stone floor and the pure water in the village well, thousands of acres of land, a whole province of France, all France itself, lay under the night sky, concentrated into a faint hairbreadth line. So does a whole world, with all its greatnesses and littlenesses, lie in a twinkling star. And as mere human knowledge can split a ray of light and analyse the manner of its composition, so sublimer intelligences may read in the feeble shining of this earth of ours every thought and act, every vice and virtue of every responsible creature on it. The Defarges, husband and wife, came lumbering under the starlight in their public vehicle to that gate of Paris where unto their journey naturally tended. There was the usual stoppage at the barrier guardhouse, and the usual lanterns came glancing forth for the usual examination and inqui inquiry. Monsieur Defarge alighted, knowing one or two of the soldiery there and one of the police. The latter he was intimate with and affectionately embraced. When Saint Antoine had again enfolded the Defarges in his dusky wings, and they, having finally alighted near the saint's boundaries, were picking their way on foot through the black mud and offal of his streets, Madame Defarge spoke to her husband. Say then, my friend, what did Jacques of the police tell thee? Very little tonight, but all he knows. There is another spy commissioned for our quarter. There may be many more, for all that he can say, but he knows of one. Heh, well, said Madame Defarge, raising her eyebrows with a cool business air. Is it, it is necessary to register him. How do they call that man? He is English. So much the better. His name? Barsad, said Defarge, making it French by pronunciation. 
but he had been so careful to get it accurately that he then spelt it with perfect correctness. Barsad, repeated Madame. Good. Christian name? John. John Barsad, repeated Madame, after murmuring it once to herself. Good. His appearance, is it known? Age about forty years, height about five foot nine, black hair, complexion dark, generally rather handsome visage, eyes dark, face thin, long and sallow, nose aquiline but not straight, having a peculiar inclination towards the left cheek, expression therefore sinister. Eh, <laughs> my faith, it is a portrait, said Madame, laughing. He shall be registered tomorrow. They turned into the wine shop, which was closed, for it was midnight, and where Madame Defarge immediately took her post at her desk, counting the small monies that had been taken during her absence, examined the stock, went through the entries in the book, made other entries of her own, checked the serving man in every possible way, and finally dismissed him to bed. Then she turned out the contents of the bowl of money for the second time, and began knotting them up in her handkerchief, in a chain of separate knots, for safe keeping through the night. All this while, Defarge, with his pipe in his mouth, walked up and down, complacently admiring, but never interfering, in which condition, indeed, as to the business and his domestic affairs, he walked up and down through life. The night was hot, and the shop, close shut and surrounded by so foul a neighbourhood, was ill-smelling. Monsieur Defarge's olfactory sense was by no means delicate, but the stock of wine smelt much stronger than it ever tasted, and so did the stock of rum and brandy and aniseed. He whiffed the compound of scents away as he put down his smoked-out pipe. "'You are fatigued,' said Madame, raising her glance as she knotted the money. There are usually, there are only the usual odours. I am a little tired, her husband acknowledged. You are a little depressed, too, said Madame, whose quick eyes had never been so intent on the accounts, but they had had a ray or two for him. Oh, the men, the men. But my dear, began Defarge. But my dear, repeated Madame, nodding firmly. But, my dear, you are faint of heart to-night, my dear. Well, then, said Defarge, as if a thought were wrung out of his breast. It is a long time. It is a long time, repeated his wife. And when is it not a long time? Vengeance and ret retribution require a long time. It is the rule. It does not take a long time to strike a man with lightning, said Defarge. How long, demanded Madame composedly, does it take to make and store the lightning? Tell me. Defarge raised his head thoughtfully, as if there were something in that too. It does not take a long time, said Madame, for an earthquake to swallow a town. There well, tell me how long it takes to prepare the earthquake. A long time, I suppose, said Defarge. But when it is ready, it takes place, and grinds to pieces everything before it. In the meantime, it is always preparing, though it is not seen or heard. That is your consolation. Keep it. She tied a knot with flashing eyes, as if it throttled a foe. I tell thee, said Madame, extending her right hand for emphasis, that although it is a long time on the road, it is on the road and coming. I tell thee it never retreats and never stops. I tell thee it is always advancing. Look around and consider the lives of all the world that we know, consider the faces of all the world that we know, 
Consider the rage and discontent to which the Jacquerie addresses itself with more and more of certainty every hour. Can such things last? Ta! I mock you. My brave wife, returned Defarge, standing before her with his head a little bent and his hands clasped at his back, like a docile and attentive pupil before his catechist. I do not question all this, but it has lasted a long time, and it is possible, you know well, my wife, it is possible that it may not come during our lives. Eh, well, how then? demanded Madame, tying another lot, a knot, as if there were another enemy strangled. Well, said Defarge, with a half complaining and half apologetic shrug, we shall not see the triumph. We shall have helped it, returned Madame, with her extended hand in strong action. Nothing that we do is done in vain. I believe with all my soul that we shall see the triumph. But even if not, even if I knew certainly not, show me the neck of an aristocrat and tyrant, and still I would... Then Madame, with her teeth set, tied a very terrible knot indeed. Hold, cried Defarge, reddening a little as if he felt charged with cowardice. I too, my dear, will stop at nothing. Yes, but it is your weakness that you sometimes need to see your victim and your opportunity to sustain you. Sustain yourself without that. When the time comes, let loose a tiger and a devil, but wait for the time with the tiger and the devil chained, not shown, yet always ready. Madame enforced the conclusion of this piece of advice by striking her little counter with her chain of money as if she knocked its brains out, and then gathering the heavy handkerchief under her arm in a serene manner and observing that it was time to go to bed. Next noontide saw the admirable woman in her usual place in the wine shop, knitting away assiduously. A rose lay beside her, and if she now and then glanced at the flower, it was with no infraction of her usual preoccupied air. There were a few customers, drinking or not drinking, standed or seated, sprinkled about. The day was very hot and heaps of flies who were extending their inquisitive and adventurous pre sorry, perquisitions into all the glutinous little glasses near Madame fell dead at the bottom. Their decease made no impression on the other flies out promenading, who looked at them in the coolest manner, as if they themselves were elephants or something as far removed, until they met the same fate. Curious to consider how heedless flies are, Perhaps they thought as much at court that sunny summer day. A figure entering at the door threw a shadow on Madame Defarge, which she felt to be a new one. She laid down her knitting and began to pin her rose in her headdress before she looked at the figure. It was curious. The moment Madame Defarge took up the rose, the customers ceased talking and began gradually to drop out of the wine shop. Good day, madame, said the newcomer. Good day, monsieur. She said it aloud, but added to herself as she resumed her knitting. Ha! Good day, age about forty, height about five feet nine, black hair, generally rather handsome visage, complexion, complexion dark, eyes dark, thin, long and sallow face, aquiline nose but not straight, having a peculiar inclination towards the left cheek which imparts a sinister expression. Good day, one and all. Have the goodness to give me a little glass of old cognac and a mouthful of cool fresh water, madame. Madame complied with a polite air. Marvellous cognac, this, madame. It was the first time it had ever been so complimented, and Madame Defarge knew enough of its antecedents to know better. She said, however, that the cognac was flattered, 
and took up her knitting. The visitor watched her fingers for a few moments and took the opportunity of observing the place in general. You knit with great skill, madame. I am accustomed to it. A pretty pattern, too. You think so? said madame, looking at him with a smile. Decidedly. May one ask what it is for? Pastime, said madame, still looking at him with a smile while her fingers moved nimbly. Not for use? That depends. I may find a use for it one day. If I do, well, said Madame, drawing a breath and nodding her head with a stern kind of coquetry, I'll use it. It was remarkable, but the taste of Saint Antoine seemed to be decidedly opposed to a rose on the headdress of Madame Defarge. Two men had entered separately and been, had been about to order drink when, catching sight of that novelty, they faltered, made a pretense of looking about as if for some friend who was not there, and went away. Nor of those who had been there when this visitor entered was there one left. They had all dropped off. The spy had kept his eyes open but had been able to detect no sign. They had lounged away in a poverty-stricken, purposeless, accidental manner, quite natural and unimpeachable. John, thought Madame, checking off her work as her fingers knitted and her eyes looked at the stranger, stay long enough and I shall knit Barsad before you go. You have a husband, Madame? I have. Children? No children. Business seems bad. Business is very bad. The people are so poor. Ah, the unfortunate, miserable people. So oppressed, too, as you say. As you say, Madame retorted, correcting him and deftly knitting an extra something into his name that boded him no good. Pardon me, certainly it was I who said so, but you naturally think so, of course. I think, returned Madame in a high voice. I and my husband have enough to do to keep this wine shop open without thinking. All we think here is how to live. That is the subject we think of, and it gives us from morning to night enough to think about without embarrassing our heads concerning others. I think for others? <laughs> no, no. The spy, who was there to pick up any crumbs he could find or make, did not allow his baffled state to express itself in his sinister face, but stood with an air gossiping gallantry, leaning his elbow on Madame Defarge's little counter and occasionally sipping his cognac. A bad business this, Madame, of Gaspard's execution. Ah, the poor Gaspard, with a sigh of great compassion. My faith, returned Madame, coolly and lightly, if people use knives for such purposes, they have to pay for it. He knew beforehand what the price of his luxury was. He has paid the price. I believe, said the spy, dropping his soft voice to a tone that invited confidence, and expressing an injured revolutionary susceptibility in every muscle of his wicked face. I believe there is much compassion and anger in this neighbourhood touching the poor fellow between ourselves. Is there? asked Madame vacantly. Is there not? Ah, here is my husband, said Madame Defarge. As the keeper of the wine shop entered at the door, the spy saluted him by touching his hat and saying with an engaging smile, Good day, Jacques. Defarge stopped short and stared at him. Good day, Jacques, the spy repeated with not quite so much confidence or quite so easy a smile under the stare. <laughs> you deceive yourself, monsieur, returned the keeper of the wine shop. You mistake me for another. That is not my name. I am Ernest Defarge. 
it is all the same, said the spy airily, but discomforted too. Good day. Good day, answered Defarge dryly. I was saying to Madame, with whom I had the pleasure of chatting when you entered, that they tell me there is, and no wonder, much sympathy and anger in Saint Antoine, touching the unhappy fate of poor Gaspard. No one has told me so, said Defarge, shaking his head. I know nothing of it. Having said it, he passed behind the little counter and stood with his hand on the back of his wife's chair, looking over that barrier at the person to whom they were both opposed and whom either of them would have shot with the greatest satisfaction. The spy, well used to, t used to his business, did not change his unconscious attitude, but drained his little glass of cognac, took a sip of fresh water and asked for another glass of cognac. Madame Defarge poured it out for him, took to her knitting again and hummed a little song over it. "'You seem to know the quarter well. "'That is to say, better than I do,' observed Defarge. "'Not at all, but I hope to know it better. "'I am so profoundly interested in its miserable inhabitants.' <laughs> muttered Defarge. "'The pleasure of conversing with you, Monsieur Defarge, "'recalls to me,' pursued the spy, "'that I have the honour of cherishing some interesting associations with your name.' Indeed, said Defarge with much indifference. Yes, indeed. When Dr. Manette was released, you, his old domestic, had the charge of him, I know. He was delivered to you. You see, I am informed of the circumstances. Such is the fact, certainly, said Defarge. He had had it conveyed to him in an ex accidental touch of his wife's elbow as she knitted and warbled that he would do best to answer, but always with brevity. "'It was to you,' said the spy, "'that his daughter came, "'and it was from your care that his daughter took him, "'accompanied by a neat brown monsieur, "'how is he called, in a little wig, "'Lorry, of the bank of Telson and Company, "'over to England.' "'Such is the fact,' repeated Defarge. "'Very interesting remembrances,' said the spy. I have known Dr. Manette and his daughter in England. Yes, said Defarge. You don't hear much about them now, said the spy. No, said Defarge. In effect, Madame struck in, looking up from her work and her little song. We never hear about them. We received the news of their safe arrival, and perhaps another letter, or perhaps two, but since then they have gradually taken their road in life, we ours, and we have held no correspondence. Perfectly so, madame, replied the spy. She is going to be married. Going? echoed madame. She was pretty enough to have been married long ago. You English are cold, it seems to me. "'Oh, you know I am English.' "'I perceive your tongue is,' returned Madame, "'and what the tongue is, I suppose the man is.' "'He did not take the identification as a compliment, "'but he made the best of it and turned it off with a laugh. "'After sipping his cognac to the end, he added, "'Yes, Miss Manette is going to be married, "'but not to an Englishman.' to one who, like herself, is French by birth. And speaking of Gaspard, ah, poor Gaspard, it was cruel, cruel. It is a curious thing that she is going to marry the nephew of Monsieur the Marquis, for whom Gaspard was exalted to that height of so many feet. In other words, the present Marquis. But he lives unknown in England. He is no Marquis there. He is Mr. Charles Darnay. Dalnay is the name of his mother's family. Madame Defarge knitted steadily, but the intelligence had a palpable effect upon her husband. Do what he would behind the little counter as to the striking of a light and the lighting of his pipe, he was troubled and his hand was not trustworthy. 
The spy would have been no spy if he had failed to see it, or to record it in his mind. Having made at least this one hit, whatever it might prove to be worth, and no customers coming in to help him to any other, Mr Barsad paid for what he had drunk and took his leave, taking occasion to say, in a genteel manner before he departed, that he looked forward to the pleasure of seeing Monsieur and Madame Defarge again. For some minutes after he had emerged into the outer presence of Saint Antoine, the husband and wife remained exactly as he had left them, lest he should come back. Can it be true? said Defarge in a low voice, looking down at his wife as he stood smoking with his hand on the back of her chair, what he has said of Mademoiselle Manette. As he, as he has said it, returned Madame, lifting her eyebrows a little, it is probably false, but it may be true. If it is, Defarge began and stopped. If it is, repeated his wife, and if it does come while we live to see it triumph, I hope for her sake destiny will keep her husband out of France. Her husband's destiny, said Madame Defarge with her usual composure, will take him where he is to go, and will lead him to the end that is to end him. That is all I know. But it is very strange. Now, at least, is it not very strange, said Defarge, rather pleading with his wife to induce her to admit it, that after all our sympathy for Monsieur her father and herself, her husband's name should be proscribed under your hand at this moment, by the, inside, by the side of that infernal dogs who has just left us. Stranger things than that will happen when it does come, answered Madame. I have them both here of a certainty, and they are both here for their merits. That is enough. She rolled up her knitting when she had said those words, and presently took the rose out of the handkerchief that was wound about her head. Either Saint Antoine had an instinctive sense that the objectionable decoration was gone, or Saint Antoine was on the watch for its disappearance. Howbeit, the saint took courage to lounge in very shortly afterwards, and the wine shop recovered its habitual aspect. In the evening, at which season of all others Saint Antoine turned himself inside out and sat on doorsteps and window ledges and came to the corners of vile streets and courts for a breath of air, Madame Defarge, with her work in her hand, was accustomed to pass from place to place and from group to group. A missionary, there were many like her, such as the world will do well never to breed again. All the women knitted. They knitted worthless things, but the mechanical work was a mechanical substitute for ink eating and drinking. The hands moved for the jaws and the digestive apparatus. If the bony fingers had been still, the stomachs would have been more famine-pinched. But as the fingers went, the eyes went, and the thoughts. And as Madame Defarge moved on from group to group, all three went quicker and fiercer among every little knot of women that she had spoken with and left behind. Her husband smoked at his door, looking after her with admiration. A great woman, said he, a strong woman, a grand woman, a frightfully grand woman. Darkness closed around. And then came the ringing of church bells and the distant beating of the military drums in the palace courtyard as the women sat knitting, knitting. Darkness encompassed them. Another darkness was closing in as surely when the church bells, then ringing pleasantly in many an airy steeple over France, should be melted into thundering cannon when the military drums should be beating to drown a wretched voice, that night all potent as the voice of power and plenty, freedom and life. So much was closing in about the women who sat knitting, knitting, that they built, that they their very selves were closing in around a structure yet unbuilt, where they were to sit, knitting, 
knitting, counting, dropping heads. And that is where we shall take a break. Dun dun dun! Whoa, the revolution is coming! But yes, let us let us go take a break. Do break related things. I think something serious might be coming up. Really? No. Fun fact, women did... Yes, I know, they did indeed use nicking. Yes, they stole things. Uh, knitting as a code. Yes, they also... Wow, okay. I've just been reading Dickens and now I can't read... Participated. They also participated to the fledgling attempts to government after and during the revolution and sat and listened while knitting at first. They eventually became popular and very vocal, got surnamed Les Tricoteurs, the knitters, and participated in killing off several other political parties. Yep, this is true. They were they were pretty powerful. Um, and yeah. No one dies like Gaspar. Nice. Um, but yes. Uh, go let's let's go to a break. Go do break related things. Um, and we shall see you back in about five minutes. And bye for now.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope we are doing well. I hope we have had a good break. Dog has put her head on your lap. You are now immobilised forever. Oh, no. Cannot move if dog or cat is sitting on you. Them's the rules. I didn't make them. Um, but, yes, I hope everybody has had a good break. I hope everybody's feeling somewhat revolutionary. Because... Um, that's nighttime cereal. Nice. My brother, my brother is is one of those people who always has cereal at basically every time of the day. Um, so you haven't moved an inch. Nice. Well, that's a perfectly decent way to spend the break. Um, but yeah, hope everybody is 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 doing well. Um, I I have had a restorative square of chocolate because I needed it. Um. I've not made a tea because it's actually quite warm in my room at the moment and yeah stuff things ah my brain is just chocolate is indeed the best medicine it it is it is the best it is very good but as you can probably tell from my voice I'm a little bit croaky so I might do one chapter which is very short I might do two chapters which are all I mean both of these chapters are very short so we shall see you want chocolate and Albert dog? Uh, sad times. Chocolate and dog do not necessarily go very well together. Um, we are now on chapter 17. Book 2, chapter 17. If Sam is around to do stuff and things. Not that that matters too much. Because I imagine you can just scroll down on the current pinned thing. But, eh. Um, but, yes. Uh, we, we, we have... We have revolution in the air we have spies and exciting things so chapter 17 it was yes but I should take a sip of my water really need to stop doing the bad French accent I mean I guess it's thematic for this book but I need to stop um, but yes let us continue <clears throat> if we're all sitting comfortably have a drink, have a whatever. Um, uh, yeah, we shall continue with chapter 17, One Night. Never did the sun go down with a brighter glory on the quiet corner in Soho than one memorable evening when the doctor and his daughter sat under the plane tree together. Nep. Excuse me. Never did the moon rise with a milder radiance over great London than on that night when it found them still seated under the tree and shone upon their faces through its leaves. Lucy was to be married tomorrow. She had reserved this last evening for her father and they sat alone under the plane tree. You are happy, my dear father? Quite, my child. They had said little, though they had been there a long time. When it was yet light enough to work and read, she had neither engaged herself in her usual work, nor had she read to him. She had employed herself in both ways at his side under the tree many and many a time, but this time was not quite like any other, and nothing could make it so. And I am very happy tonight, dear father. I am deeply happy in the love that heaven has so blessed, my love for Charles and Charles's love for me. But if my life were not to be still consecrated to you, or if my marriage were so arranged as that it would part us, even by the length of a few of these streets, I should be more unhappy and self-reproachful now that I can tell you. Even as it is, even as it was, she could not command her voice. In the sad moonlight, she clasped him by the neck and laid her face upon his breast. In the moonlight, which is always sad, as the light of the sun itself is, as the light called human life is, at its coming and its going. Dearest dear, can you tell me this last time that you feel quite, quite sure no new affections of mine and no new duties of mine will ever interpose between us. I know it well, but do you know it? In your own heart, do you feel quite certain? 
her father answered with a cheerful firmness of conviction he could scarcely have assumed. Quite sure, my darling. More than that, he added as he tenderly kissed her. My future is far brighter, Lucy, seen through your marriage than it could have been, nay, than ever it was without it. If I could hope that, my father, believe it, love, indeed it is so. Consider how natural and plain it is, my dear, that it should be so. You, devoted and young, cannot fully appreciate the anxiety I have felt that your life should not be wasted. She moved her hand towards his lips, but he took it in his and repeated the word. Wasted, my child, should not be wasted, struck aside from the natural order of things, for my sake. Your unselfishness cannot entirely comprehend how much my mind has gone on this, but only ask yourself, how could my happiness be perfect while yours was incomplete? If I had never seen Charles, my father, I should have been quite happy with you. He smiled at her unconscious admission that she would have been unhappy without Charles having seen him, and replied, My child, you did see him, and it is Charles. If it had not been Charles, it would have been another. Or, if it had been no other, I should have been the cause, and then the dark part of my life would have cast its shadow beyond myself and would have fallen on you. It was the first time, except at the trial, of her ever hearing him refer to this period of his suffering. It gave her a strange and new sensation while his words were in her ears, and she remembered it long afterwards. See, said the doctor of Beauvais, raising his hand towards the moon, I have looked at her from my prison window when I could not bear her light. I have looked at her when it has been such torture to me to think of her shining upon what I had lost, that I have beaten my head against my prison walls. I have looked at her in a state so dull and lethargic that I have thought of nothing but the number of horizontal lines I could draw across her at the full, and the number of perpendicular lines with which I could intersect them. He added in his inward and pondering manner as he looked at the moon, it was twenty either way, I remember, and the twentieth was difficult to squeeze in. The strange thrill with which she heard him go back to that time deepened as he dwelt upon it, but there was nothing to shock her in the manner of his reference. He only seemed to contrast his present cheerfulness and felicity with the dire endurance that was over. I have looked at her speculating thousands of times upon the unborn child from whom I had been rent, whether it was alive, whether it had been born alive or the poor mother's shock had killed it, whether it was a son who would some day avenge his father. There was a time in my imprisonment when my desire for vengeance was unbearable, whether it was a son who would never know his father's story who might even live to weigh the possibility of his father's having disappeared of his own will and act, whether it was a daughter who would grow to be a woman. She drew closer to him and kissed his cheek and his hand. I have pictured my daughter to myself as perfectly forgetful of me, or rather altogether ignorant of me and unconscious of me. I have cast up the years of her age, year after year, I have seen her married to a man who knew nothing of my fate. I have altogether perished from the remembrance of the living, and in the next generation my place was a blank. My father, even to hear that you had, had, you had such thoughts of a daughter who never existed, strikes to my heart as if I had been that child. You, Lucy? It is out of the consolation and restoration you have brought to me that these remembrances arise and pass between us and the moon on this last night. What did I say just now? She knew nothing of you, she cared nothing for you. So, but on other moonlit nights, when the sadness and the silence have touched me in a different way, have affected me with 
something as like a sorrowful sense of peace, as any emotion that had pain for its foundations could. I have imagined her as coming to me in my cell and leading me out into the freedom beyond the fortress. I have seen her image in the moonlight often, as I now see you, except that I never held her in my arms. It stood between that little grated window and the door. But you understand that that was not the child I am speaking of. The, the figure was not, the, the image, the fancy. No, that was another thing. It stood before my disturb, disturbed sense of sight, but it never moved. The phantom that my mind pursued was another and more real child. Of her outward appearance I know more, no more than that she was like her mother. The other had that likeness too, as you have, but was not the same. Can you follow me, Lucy? Hardly, I think. I doubt you must have been a solitary prisoner to understand these perplexed distinctions. His collected and calm manner could not prevent her blood from running cold as he thus tried to anatomise his old condition. In that more peaceful state, I have imagined her in the moonlight coming to me and taking me out to show me that the home of her married life was full of her loving remembrance of her lost father. My picture was in her room, and I was in her prayers. Her life was active, cheerful, useful, but my poor history pervaded it all. I was that child, my father. I was not half so good, but in my love that was I. And she showed me her children, said the doctor of Beauvais, and they had heard of me and had been taught to pity me. When they passed a prison of the state, they kept far from its frowning walls and looked up at its bars and spoke in whispers. She could never deliver me. I imagined that she always brought me back after showing me such things. But then, blessed with the relief of tears, I fell upon my knees and blessed her. I am that child, I hope, my father. Oh, my dear, my dear, will you bless me as fervently tomorrow? Lucy, I recall these old troubles in the reason that I have tonight for loving you better than words can tell and thanking God for my great happiness. My thoughts, when they were wildest, never rose near the happiness that I have known with you and that we have before us. He embraced her, solemnly commended her to heaven and humbly thanked heaven for having bestowed her on him. By and by they went into the house. There was no one bidden to the marriage but Mr. Lorry. There was even to be no bridesmaid but the gaunt Miss Pross. The marriage was to make no change in their place of residence. They had been able to extend it by taking to themselves the upper rooms formerly belonging to the apocryphal invis invisible lodger, and they desired nothing more. Dr. Manette was very cheerful at the little supper. There were only three at table, and Miss Pross made the third. He regretted that Charles was not there was more than half disposed to object to the loving little plot that kept him away, and drank to him affectionately. So the time came for him to bid Lucy good night, and they separated. But in the stillness of the third hour of the morning, Lucy came downstairs again and stole into his room, not free from unshaped fears beforehand. All things, however, were in their places. All was quiet, and he lay asleep, his white hair picturesque on the untroubled pillow, and his hands lying quiet on the coverlet. She put her needle sorry, she put her needless candle in the shadow at a distance, crept up to his bed, and put her lips to his, then leaned over him and looked at him. 
Into his handsome face the bitter waters of captiv captivity had worn, but he covered up their tracks with a determination so strong that he held the mastery of them even in his sleep. A more remarkable face in its quiet, resolute and guarded struggle with an unseen assailant was not to be beheld in all the wide dominions of sleep that night. She timidly laid her hand on his dear breast and put up a prayer that she might ever be as true to him as her love aspired to be and as his sorrows deserved. Then she withdrew her hand and kissed his lips once more and went away. So the sunrise came and the shadows of the leaves of the plane tree moved upon his face as softly as her lips had moved in praying for him. And I think we shall actually end there tonight. Thank you for listening, because I am very tired. <laughs>to throw my book off the desk you can hear the spelling now that you don't just assume the english version yeah i'm trying i'm trying to be lucy rather than lucy like a bit more emphasis on the on the e because it's french um but uh oh dear yes voices <clears throat> voices somewhat croaky um but yeah i hope you all enjoyed that it is as ever a wonderful story and I'm very much enjoying reading it. I hope you are enjoying listening to it too. Um, Dickens is, as ever, the just uh, a joy to read. Absolute joy to read. Um, it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Oh, hello, Zilia. I didn't realise you were there. Welcome in. Although you've probably been here for a while. But yes. Yeah. Uh, let's, shall we see if there's anyone to raid? And thank you, Andy Pants. Hope I get some rest and feel better soon. Yes, I, I will. It, I will. I will be fine. He does words good. He does do words good. You lurk, lurk away. Lurking is always good and fine and wonderful. Um, but yeah, I guess we can we can hop on over to Stephen. Um, got Stephen. We've got Cam. Oh, we can do Cam. Um, I guess there was also there's also um, Bowie hair. Live for the first time in a while. Um, I don't know, Sam. Do you have a preference? Stephen or Cam? You can make a decision because my brain has gone walkies and no, cannot, cannot make decisions right now. Can't, can't do it. Not happening. Um, oh, excuse me. Stephen? Yeah, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll be creatures of habit. So, um, Yes, thank you all very much for being here, all you wonderful, lovely people. Um, we should be back on Saturday, hopefully, with some... Oh, you used the raid. All right, fine. <laughs> oh, I used unraid. I didn't click anything. Hang on, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do the raid. That was weird. Boop. Um, I hadn't unraid. I hadn't clicked anything. Um, but, yes... We should be back on Saturday for some more stuff. Not entirely sure what. Uh, Sam will... Might say, might not. Who knows? But yes, go have a good rest of your weeks. Week, whatever. And be lovely people. And you're all wonderful. Thank you very much for being here. And we shall see you here again soon. Thank you and good night.